In this video I'm going to talk from the perspective of someone born in the late 90s, but you can apply the same logic if you were born earlier or later than that. So apologies if this video makes anyone feel old. Um, that's not, not sort of what I mean by it. Um, the things I say here you could apply whenever you were born. For a long time I've had this really vivid curiosity that I think is shared by a lot of people who are interested in history and this video is going to be my attempt to put that curiosity into words with the help of some very close friends with whom, I, with whom I've been working uh, on a project for the last four or five years that's kind of relevant to the topic of the video. Um, so I want you to imagine that you're, uh, you're where you live, so in my case southeastern England, but 80 years ago you're suddenly transported 80 years in the past into a side alley beside somebody's house or whatever the equivalent is where you live um, and you sort of creep along the brick wall you can feel the rough bricks under your fingers and the sort of the air's a bit cool but it's you know the sun's possibly coming out um, and you, you wander towards their back garden and as you sort of stand there listening you can hear two people talking in the back garden and it sounds something like your geographic region's equivalent of this Another thing, I, what I know is, is, it's not just the rationing, it's, it's even the price of milk. Because it used, oh, I saw, I saw yeah, it's gone saw up. Down the tobacconist the other day. They've it, all been talking it's about It's gone up to it something work. like five, five pence a penny, hasn't it? Yeah, five pence a penny for a pint of milk. Where, what was it before, something like four or something like that? Four four pence, I, I remember so. when, I mean you might not remember, I'd, you're a bit younger than me, but I remember when uh, you could get a pint of milk for about a penny. Really? Yes. And that's the thing, I mean, it's something you need in the house. I mean, you, you can't do yeah. without milk. I mean, by the time you've got, got your weekly shopping, you sort of... You've got fuck all left. And over half you? your mortgage. That's it, you've got, just, fuck, you've got fuck all left. Now, that was obviously just me and my friend pretending. But I would find this experience really weird. And I think the reasons I would find it weird are the, the base for the rest of this video. The first thing I'd find weird would be something I've discussed on this channel before, and that would be hearing people talk normally to each other. So the men trip over their words, they abort sentences and restart them. They talk over each other, they're having a genuine dynamic conversation. It's not scripted, uh, it's not there to progress the drama of some plot. It's just two people talking completely normally to each other, not thinking anyone else can hear them. I'm going to show you a bit of footage from an episode of Candid Camera from 1974. The man in the hat is an actor, but the man on the right is just a normal taxi driver who doesn't know he's being recorded. Yeah, she's a bit upset. I should... Uh, I, I should... think maybe we ought to change the story. I'll go in and tell her that uh, we were doing good works together on the South Downs. I shouldn't alter it now because she'd say, well, immediately, why well, keep changing your story? Yeah. If I was you, I should calmly walk in and yeah. go and sit down and, uh, and make the best of it. She'll come round. You'll find she'll come round. She's, yeah. a, she's a bit annoyed at the moment, but we all are when her temper's probably. Yeah. Yeah. But when, you, when your temper goes down, then you but can tell her, tell her that the fly's bit me and I made, made, no, me, no, made me funny. I, I can't go any further. No, I'll just she go get some money. She gets my badge now, you Oh, no, that's all right. Drop. You better hide it. Uh, <laughs> It's just a man in the middle of the street giving a piece of genuine advice to a bloke he's just met. And this is, you can imagine this being the kind of thing you would actually see if you travelled back in time to the 1970s, albeit filtered through an old camera, which is another thing we'll talk about. Um, and it's pretty normal. I mean, he, he, he speaks in a way which is possibly slightly out of reach to somebody my age nowadays. So he uses um, should, where I would use would, uh, he says, I shouldn't alter it now rather than I wouldn't alter it now. Uh, and I think his accent also is, is slightly unusual from the perspective of a modern city-dwelling person. Uh, but if, if you lived in Britain in 1974, this video probably isn't strange at all. It's just a bloke talking to another bloke. But to me, even though it shouldn't, the normality of it really surprises me. Um, and what makes that particularly strange is that if you took my life from the day I was born and played it backwards to the age I am now, I'd only be one year off when this was recorded anyway. So why do I feel like the difference between 1975 and 1998 is so much more massive than the difference between 1998 and 2021? If you were born in 1975, you might feel the same way about the 1930s. 
you and me have talked about kind of films where dialogues mm. portrayed naturalistically. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also um, obviously like documentaries and things. Because yeah. in like the um, sort of early '60s, they finally had like handheld film cameras. Which I mean, up to that point, it was the huge like studio ones, so you could only really film on on sets, not on location. And then um, in the early '60s, suddenly you could actually go out on the street and film handheld. So a lot of like French films from that time used that a lot, just like going out and filming on the street and stuff. And um, obviously, then you can capture a lot more of that sort of naturalistic conversation. And it's really it's weird, I think, how you kind of look at the past as almost like a kind of like a film or something you don't really like you think of yeah. when you think of like the 70s you almost don't think of it as an actual thing that moment happens. in time like it is now you think of like oh the like Saturday Night Fever costumes and stuff but um yeah. when you actually like see a documentary or something which has just been filmed very naturalistically it kind of it's, just a weird, it's a weird experience that kind of puts you there in that time, I think. Yeah. There's like a really um, interesting TV documentary they did in the early 70s called, I think it's called The Family or something, which is literally just they went into like a British household and just filmed the family for like a week. And it's literally just the, like the parents having an argument or like the children getting ready for school. It's really... Because you you don't, you don't usually see that from that period. It's very interesting, I think, to because yeah. uh, nobody it, it doesn't occur to anybody to I, either like before then it's too expensive to, to go yeah. about recording things like that, or from that period it doesn't occur to anyone to because why I think I think there was definitely a period in like um in like American films and that in like especially the seventies where they tried to be a bit more naturalistic mm. and kind of uh, I mean especially compared to like the 1930s where the dialogue's very like over the top I suppose was that was that like a continuation of theatre um yeah yeah I think so it was just sort of a very like theatrical dramatic dialogue which isn't nobody actually talks like that I mean even I think of any film whether it's anything that's scripted it's kind of impossible to really capture naturalism in the dialogue yeah. I mean it, I was thinking that there are films that do it really well I can't think of any but right now but no. I think that Beach Boys one was pretty good. Yeah, but I, I feel like even then they probably improvise over it a bit. Yeah, that's tr yeah because imp imp yeah, like mm. when we were doing the clip just down there, the improvising it like you said made it a lot more a lot easier to be naturalistic yeah. with it rather than. But I've got these things to say and I need to say them in this order. Another thing that I'm, I was I think I was talking to you about it at one point, which is quite interesting, is that um, I feel like for the last like since maybe like 2009 or something is really the only period of time where there's so much of just natural life captured on like phones and things yeah. so you, you could probably could go back on YouTube to any day in like the last from like 2010 to now and probably find like a vlog or something yeah from that specific day but if you wanted to do it for the 70s or something then you couldn't really do You'd that only either. find scraps yeah yeah let's switch back to that 1940s conversation we eavesdropped on Apart from the way people spoke, what else might we find weird about this experience? Or other aspects of the sensory experience of being in the 1940s might feel surprising for the same kinds of reasons. The chill of the air would feel the same as it does now. The coolness of a brick wall would feel more or less the same as it does now, although the bricks might be a slightly different texture depending on where you were. The experience of being in 3D space would be the same as it is now, which is something we're only on the cusp of being able to convey through virtual reality nowadays. And that, I think, is a really major part of why it's hard to put ourselves into the past. Let's jump away from the 1940s example again and imagine we're talking to somebody we know at relatively close quarters. A huge number of things are going on here that really don't come across over video. I could angle this camera so that we're in a more conversational arrangement, but ultimately, when you're talking to someone in person, not only are they three-dimensional, they also take up quite a lot of space. If you're fairly close to them, then their head alone might take up quite a large part of what you see, and obviously, barring medical conditions, you can see their face in extraordinary detail. Your eyes probably have a wider dynamic range than a lot of old cameras, and in fact probably the camera I'm using. If you're looking at really bright sunlight next to really dark shadow, your eyes are perfectly good at picking up detail in both of them, whereas an older camera might have to prioritise one and overexpose or underexpose the other. 
in person you can flick your eyes to someone's nose and their hair and their ear and your eye uh, your eyes will focus on whatever you're looking at, but on video you're stuck with whatever was in focus when the person was filming. In my endless plight to try and overcome this kind of thing, I've been helped by the fact that me and some friends are doing this project set about 50 years ago, and we've been using some analogue filming techniques, real ones and synthesised ones. So that's helped me kind of get to grips with the relationship between what something looks like on film and what it looks like in real life. Um, which is a relationship you're probably automatically familiar with if you were born a bit earlier, or if you do film photography nowadays. Um, and this sort of made me feel as if I could suddenly look at other film photos from the 60s and 70s and mentally reverse engineer them to imagine what it might have been like to be there. We build up this idea of the past as something alien, where people spoke differently and somehow didn't know as much. Uh, and like Birchall says um, in a recording that I've either already played or will play later in the video, it, it, you know, you, you imagined it as almost like you'd imagine a film. It's not a real place, it's not a real thing that people actually lived through that was 3D. If I look at a video of my uncle taken in 1989, I feel a weird sense that it's a world I'm not supposed to be in. But when you consider this is actually a video of my friend Stanit taken very recently, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more accessible. In the same way, this photo is of Thomas Edison, and it's been colourised using a new technique that preserves subsurface scattering in the skin, which has been developed by researchers at the University of Washington and UC Berkeley. And there are a couple of links in the description to videos and to the website of that. I think there's a GitHub. The photography style is obviously a very large part of what make, makes this original picture inaccessible, but so is the fact that he's wearing 19th century clothes. So neither of those things... Oh, is it raining? Shit, hang on. I'm now in my room. Um, what was it? This is the 19th century clothes. Um, yeah, the, the, the style, the daguerreotype, I think it's a daguerreotype style of photography is a big part of why the, the picture is kind of inaccessible to us in its original form. But the fact that he's wearing 19th century clothes also adds to that. So neither of those things in isolation makes the picture inaccessible. Because anyone could wear 19th century clothes nowadays and you could create a daguerreotype photo of someone, although it might be a bit expensive nowadays. The combination of these things signals to us this is not a real person. Of course, we recognise on a factual level they were a real person at one point, but to all intents and purposes, as far as we're concerned, they're not a real person. Until you look at a photo that looks like it might have been taken a bit more recently. You were talking about the, the experience that you had with the sunset, where you had it on, on Super 8 and then you had it on... Was, was it a sunset? So this was, this was, um, it was a few years back we went to Sweden on a sort of a holiday, and on the holiday I got two sources of footage just to sort of look back at the holiday on. And the first was like a little cine Super 8 camera, and just got some general shots of just the landscape and driving around, things like that. And also captured the same, the same kind of footage and sort of more footage of us as well but this time on a phone and obviously the phone was all sort of HD and all clean but the Super 8 once we got home had it developed it came back all as you would imagine like grainy and kind of that with that old school look and what's interesting is I had lost all the HD footage of the trip and I only had the Super 8 left and so for a few years I would sort of look back on the trip just using the Super 8 footage and my in my head I almost started to have an extra layer of um, magic when I'd watch it back and it sort of helped me romanticize the time in this in this newly you know this new frame which just added that layer from the original memory and then uh, this year actually just a few months ago I, I located the original HD footage and I watched it and just to see how clean it was was a really interesting experience because it suddenly it actually took away a lot of the charm and I don't know if it's just because you know, Super 8 is seen as something yeah. like for travel videos or whatnot, but it just having that extra filter for some reason because when when you watch something back like that you're not experiencing it. You're just seeing something which triggers the memory and having it in a more stylistic and kind of you know, warm way somehow felt a lot nicer than just seeing this very clean, sterile image. There was almost the closer to the reality you get, the more you realise you're never going to have that moment back. Yeah. Was the thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the kind of way it's flattened, the whole sensory experience is flattened into just sight. Into just. And not only just sight, but just a square of your field of vision kind of thing. And it's, it's two dimensional. In fact, I, that's one of the big things that I wonder about is with VR. I actually, I started 
I've started taking 360 degree. You can get apps where it will take loads of photos and stitch them together. I've been doing that exact thing as well. To capture them. As I've been, yeah. As you've been going along. And if you, we, you can upload them onto the Oculus or whatever, you know, um, HTC or whatnot, headsets. And you can, in VR, look at them again. And what's really interesting is I, I've got from 2014, 2016, all these 360 degree panoramic photos. And at Christmas, we put on the VR headset and looked at them. And it's, even though you're not, you're still not, cro we're not crossing that boundary back into that time. You do realize, even when doing that, just, it's amazing how we look at a 2D photo as that's the ultimate way to relive the memory. Or we see a video and we're like, that's great. But when you see this, you just, it does make you think, what will the future be of revisiting? Yeah, yeah, because um, the first time I, I did a, a VR thing, it was at uni in first year and we all kind of went to our own houses to show everyone our houses and, um, and someone had a obviously not inside the house but someone had a rift um, and the, the kind of sense of place you get like it, it was as if the location in my mind had switched to the street outside my house just from and I got used to it really quickly and you just you there's a part of your brain I think that just for a second forgets yeah. where you are and you're kind of s stimulated by that image and of course this all goes a little bit deeper than that because loads of us would love to experience the past firsthand but in what capacity do we want to experience it? Do we want to experience it as time travellers going back and visiting it as if it's a foreign country or do we want to experience, as, experience it as though we were living at the time? Because those are obviously very different things. I volunteer sometimes at Butzer Ancient Farm in Hampshire, which is a place that has various Iron Age and Roman and Anglo-Saxon reconstructed buildings. And for the first few months of being there, about four years ago, I worked in the Anglo-Saxon area making roof tiles. Um, and the first time I went there, everything smelled really strongly of smoke. And the, uh, the sort of wood that I was cutting smelled of tannins and things like that. But within a few weeks, I wouldn't have told you it really smelled of anything. Even though I only went there sporadically, I didn't really notice that it smelled much of smoke anymore. I think you probably understand what I mean. For us, what we're living through is so completely mundane that it never occurs to us that it might be extremely interesting to somebody in the future. Over the last year or so, we've all lived through something that I think we recognise is going to be remembered for quite a long time. And in fact, this is exactly the kind of time that would be interesting to me if I was born in 2080 or something like that. And I'm sure, I'm sure everyone, well, not everyone, I'm sure lots of people watching will agree with that. We can be pretty sure that what we're experiencing right at this moment every single mundane thing about what we do will be extremely interesting to somebody in 60 years time not everybody but somebody and in accordance with that I'm putting together a little time capsule documentary of my friends talking normally to each other and what the streets look like and stuff like that um, which I'll probably release in the next 10 years or so just in case people in the future want that kind of resource because ultimately although there is a lot more everyday normal mundane footage from today there's not as much proportionally as you might think because on the face of it something like a vlog seems fairly naturalistic compared to a radio broadcast from the 30s but they're still done stylistically you can't necessarily reconstruct how people talk in a normal conversation based on how they talk in a vlog unless somebody's filmed their friends just having a chat which is definitely occurs in vlogs but it's, it's not the main centerpiece of the person addressing the camera so to give an example, I didn't meet many Americans until I was about 18 when I was on a, um, a first year field school archaeological dig with university. Um, and all of a sudden I met all, all these kind of Americans who had come over to do this field school thing. And it was weird, having only seen Americans on telly and in vlogs and things before, it was quite weird seeing so many of them and interacting with so many of them in the same place. Because they, well... I don't know, I mean, no, no, no value judgment at all. They were really nice people and remain really nice people. And the way they acted was really interesting and cool. Um, it was just strange seeing a way of talking and a way of behaving that I had only ever seen on the telly actually being practiced by real people around me. In a way, the experience was kind of parallel to the experience of meeting a famous person. Um, and I imagine some of them probably had the same kind of weird reaction in reverse possibly elevated by the fact that they were actually in a different country. Even asking people to tell us about the past might not get us as far as we'd like to go. We can get some really interesting details, but we can also miss a huge amount. As we get older, our perception of what's normal changes to accommodate what's around us, and that can lead to us extending the present back into the past. 
If I think about the difference between 1971 and 1954, I imagine a huge difference in what people wore, what films were like, how people spoke and what people thought about politics. But if I think about the difference between 2021 and 2004, which is the same time span, uh, obviously I remember interacting with VHS videos, which aren't really a thing anymore, the little tiny things like that. But aside from that, everything seems like it was pretty much the same. People behaved broadly the same. It feels like there was nothing fundamentally different about films. The rooms in our house were the same, apart from maybe the furniture was a bit different. But when I look back at old videos, those things aren't true at all. The rooms are laid out and decorated really differently. Um, obviously the same room, but, but decorated very differently. Music was very different. If I watch a television program from back then, it looks visually old. But at the time, obviously, that was normal and modern. So I don't remember television programs looking old because they didn't at the time. My idea of normality has evolved and I've projected that idea backwards into the past. I once asked my grander if people spoke broader dialect when he was a child in the 1940s, knowing from records that they, they, they must have done, and he responded, probably, I didn't really pay attention. He lived through it, but his guess was as good as mine, about something so fundamental and everyday as speaking. In a 1977 interview with a woman called Florence Pannell, who was born in 1868, which I'll link in the description, uh, the interviewer asks her what has changed since she was young, and she responds, everything. And the word everything there is really difficult to interpret because it only ever refers to things that are salient and relevant to the speaker when they say it. Have people changed the way that they count on their fingers? Have they changed the way they rub their eyes if they're itchy? We know people smiled pretty much the same way back then as they do now, at least in photographs. When Florence Pannell says everything has changed, she only means the things that are salient to her when she says it. She only means the things that occur to her when she says it. She might be thinking about fashion and technology and people's mannerisms and a lot more than that. But if you've lived through the time, certain things about it will be so obvious to you that they don't need stating. But those things might not be so obvious to someone who's born 70 years later. Another thing that might influence somebody's memory of their own past is the fact that when you look at a photo or you take a lot of photos of a particular event, you might find that when you recollect that event in your mind, a lot of your memories are supplemented by the photos. You only remember certain things because they're in the photos. You might not even have noticed them at the time. Although, of course, you'll still have the original memories floating around and you can probably remember some things that provide context to the photos. Um, but sometimes you don't know what you remember because you were there and what you remember because you've seen a photo of it. What I found quite interesting when I was studying for my essays was the use of, like you say, the, the Kodak moment, which was when cameras started to become available to like the whole public so you didn't need like a full setup to do it or like wet plate collodion you just had like a thing you pushed you sent it off to Kodak and they sent you a film back they coined the term a uh, Kodak moment and then throughout this history until like the 90s and early 2000s before Kodak went into liquidation for a bit and then was pulled out of it they, they associate with their brand that they only wanted you to take photos of your memories and throughout the adverts it was only doing the nice things so like as it's American like your son winning a baseball game your daughter running up a horse race or something it was very like yeah. weird things like that and like it then moved on to like take photos of these nice things when you're on a holiday and like they start to associate their brand with Kodak with only photographing the good just completely ignore the bad because it's not worth thinking about and no one likes the bad parts I don't remember the good parts and like that sort of created like e even if you look in like your family albums there's not like sad memories usually it's like people smiling and happy like with a baby and they won't remember like the baby being sick on them as soon as that photo was taken yeah. they only remember like the baby in their arms and that feeling of happiness with that baby yeah. and that sort of thing and yeah so that's quite interesting and I'm sorry if this is going no, no, <laughs> off on a bit of a tangent but like what's quite interesting is you pop into the second hand shops when somebody passes away usually they get given like a box of old slides from like the 70s 
and it's like a weird peek into somebody's life, but it's only photographing the happy moments of their life. Yeah. So you're getting a very narrow view of someone else's history, and you sort of build your own narrative to it. Like this person could have been horrible, like f yeah. for all we know. But like, there's th the only photos I have of them in this a box I brought is them smiling with a baby. So they're like a very sweet, it, innocent person. Yeah. But you don't know if they were horrible and that things <laughs> like that. Yeah, and you could never know if they're if they were nice vile, or horrible. Disgusting, if, if they're disgusting vile, person. disgusting verm. <laughs> you will never ever know that. It was it was recently I was, I went for a walk um with my girlfriend and we were we have a habit of going going on a walk and we'll see a lovely sunset or a lovely view and basically the, it was at the point that at that time that the first response is get the phone out grab a picture of that that's great and I, I might want to look back on it but there was this one time it was very vivid where recently we were walking and I it was sort of a heathland and I just remember seeing the clouds were just illuminated by the sun in that certain way where they just glow sort of that golden colour and they, they seemed to be expanding, sort of moving, and you could just see the vastness. And just in that split second, I just, I entered that present moment and I just felt so connected to it and I thought, I should get a photo of this. And so I got the photo and I looked at the image and it just suddenly all clicked to me and it, it made me think how it's so strange that with the technology that we now possess and the way that we're brought up culturally to sign up, you know, be quite material and, you know, subconsciously objectify things um, in the narrative world. I found it very interesting that my first response of, upon it entering into my conscious mind what I was experiencing was, I need to own this. Yeah. I need to, I need I need to, to have this. To have it in my pocket, yeah. To yeah. take this experience which is here and it's now and it's happening. But I need to take that and by the act of trying to capture it and put it in my pocket and to relive it, you know, to try and own it, yeah. I was robbed of just that that tail end of it and it, yeah so now I try if I go out somewhere obviously there are some exceptions you know if it's like a something very special but I do know that the moment we live is the moment that we have really yeah and so to try and take a picture of it is I think for artistic reasons I can understand it but to try and capture it and to try and own it is a futile yeah. exercise right in the interest of how people talked at the time, I'm going to leave you with a, a little bit of loose audio from between takes when we were doing these interviews. But first, I'll draw your attention to the Paperweights, which is a band belonging to my pals here. Um, they've not asked me to mention them or anything. I just think they could do with some more attention. Um, they're on Spotify. They're releasing a new music video for a song, uh, which is a collaboration with another local band tomorrow, I think. So I'll, I'll link their channel in the description and update the link when it's out. Disconnect your calls We're in it for the long haul Bed sheets fill my mind I'm looking for the type of glee That's really hard to find But apart from that, thank you very much for watching And if you have any ponderings of your own About this kind of thing or just memories uh, I'll try to be a bit more active In responding to the comments uh, Than I have been for the last couple of weeks or so Thank you and I'll talk to you Hopefully sooner this time Because I've not got work to do Here is Joshua Lisica. Trained photographer. <laughs> Trained photographer. Professional photographer. Shall I shall I make out like you're extremely Annie Leibovitz famous? <laughs> just just like an unbelievably famous. And you famous. do become unbelievably famous just because people just like, because people think there's so much are. talk about who is he that you become <laughs> <laughs> you, you become like the some kind the of the photographer. The the Ponty solitary isolate. <laughs> Photographer. No, when when the people only one think of world. photographers, people don't think of anyone else. I become you. the state-branded photographer. <laughs>